uh, post production supervisor uh, is responsible for pretty much everything that happens in post production, from editorial to uh, how the director and showrunners integrate with the rest of production, the sound, uh, ADR, the grade, schedule, uh, usually a phenomenal amount of deliverables, uh, making sure everybody's in the right place at the right time. Uh, so they are looking after everything, sometimes includes visual effects if there isn't a separate team on board that does the visual effects separately. So then when that's the case, then the visual effects supervisor like myself and sometimes visual effects producer as well, um, we're responsible for just the visual effects. Um, but it means that we have to work really closely with the post-production supervisor because we're essentially taking away some things that they might normally do uh, and then integrating back uh, and sort of um, working autonomously and then sort of giving information back and working with the post-production supervisor uh, to make sure that we hit all the right notes in terms of schedule uh, and also that we are able to prioritize work that it makes some of the other aspects of post-production critical. So sound effects are a big deal when it comes to visual effects. It's very hard to design sound effects uh, if you don't have something visual to line it up to. And often the visual effects need to be at a certain stage before that work can be done. So you work directly with the post-production supervisor to, to get a schedule together, get your um, time scale in and your uh, deadlines, and then you can start collaborating properly and then hopefully it all gets delivered on time. It's really interesting because they both are really rewarding experiences, but in very different ways. So the um, as a production supervisor, uh, you are much more um, involved in the production way before we get to post. So that's including the shoot and prep and script uh, and all this scheduling that goes on with that. Plus all the creative decisions that involve visual effects, you're a part of it from the very, very beginning. Um, and you're sort of immersed in that process. You then have the joy of carrying it all the way through post-production as well. So you oversee uh, post-production as a production supervisor, uh, as well as adding to the creative aspect and keeping a creative continuity um, across the whole process of the filmmaking. It means that uh, you know, somebody like myself is across a lot of different disciplines a lot of the time, and there's not a lot of sleep involved, uh, but it's incredibly rewarding. Visual effects supervisor at a vendor uh, is equally rewarding. It's much more hands-on to the work that's actually getting done. Um, and they often have really good teams around them. And that team mechanic can mean that they can do amazing results in an amazing space of time. Um, but they also have a, a largely a really deep knowledge of very specific pipelines or technology or processes that go towards making the finished product, which, uh, you know, you could say that production visual effects supervisors are more big picture, uh, and then the visual effects supervisors within uh, vendors are more uh, attention to detail. Um, but there's a lot of gray areas in how that crosses over from one to the other. Some vendor supervisors will often be on set and part of the production uh, and be part of that collaborative process. Uh, and then some production supervisors like myself will be a mo more hands-on in certain aspects of post-production. The production supervisor is responsible for every visual effect in the entire show, no matter who's doing it. Whereas a vendor supervisor is only responsible for the work that that company is doing. And therefore, they're slightly isolated from everything else that's going on and, and need to be kept up to date um, uh, actively by production. Exactly. It's very much to do with um, complexity and volume of work. Um, uh, and, and also sometimes the distribution of work, it, even if it's not that much, but fairly complex, but it's distributed across three companies, then you want an independent team to manage that process, both creatively and schedule and integrate that back with production. You're almost a sort of conduit from the visual, the people who are actually making the visual effects and the people who want the visual effects. I don't mind sitting in dark rooms, actually. That's, that's okay. I'm not adverse to that. I've done it for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, there's a great deal of camaraderie that goes on with, with the right dark room. Uh, not sure what that means. But um, uh, it's, it was a natural evolution of uh, responsibility 
um, you know, the, the first to be uh, more involved earlier on in each project as it came along, which you don't do just as an artist. Um, you get, you know, essentially you get given what's already been shot and planned uh, and laid out and designed. You're essentially putting those pieces together. Um, so as a supervisor, you work out those pieces at the very, very beginning and then have to apologize to the artist to put them together again because it might not quite work out as planned. That, that level of creative input and responsibility is, uh, is really attractive. It varies from show to show. Um, that the, the sort of more complex ones that have uh, significant visual effects challenges, uh, they'll have somebody like me on uh, sometimes before scripts or maybe even a treatment stage. Uh, and then I will talk with the showrunner, the director, um, and the writers, and go through the script and the ideas, and try to understand the story that's trying to be told, uh, and accommodate visual effects that may or may not work for those. It, it's rarely a case, as with all visual effects, at nearly every stage, we never nail anything down. But what we are able to do is go, well, actually, that is really, really complicated, but the story to be told is really simple. So let's look at a different way of telling that story. And that happens through the script stage as well after a, a treatment. Um, often scripts will be slightly tweaked uh, to, to sort of benefit the whole process of working with everybody, including, you know, isn't, it's not just visual effects that go through this process. Um, there are a lot of other departments that sort of dip in and out and say, this is, this is not possible, we have to do it a different way. Or, oh, this is great, but we could do more. Um, and then that development goes on. And, you can also um, do quite a lot of actual work in that in that period. It isn't just having conversations. You can do previs, uh, which is sort of um, just a, a, a imagining a sequence uh, in the computer just based on the script and directorial uh, guidance uh, and, and coming up with a process that allows everybody then to understand, well, actually, if we do this that's been previs, then it means we need uh, 10 cars on an airfield uh, during the middle of the day in the winter. Um, how do we go about that? And then maybe if it doesn't work, we adjust the previs and then they go, oh, well, we don't need it in winter now or we don't need it on an airfield. We can do it on a car park. Um, and that process uh, really helps narrow down what the potential impact of any visual effects challenges. They've all got loads of challenges. That's one of the really attractive parts of visual effects for me is there's, there's quite a lot of challenges um, problem solving and, and sort of working out the best way to do things, which gives us the best result. Um, and that often requires a great deal of collaboration between departments. Uh, and, and almost every department um, can be uh, have a, a significant impact in the way the visual effects work in any given show. There's lots of challenges, lots of sort of uh, how do we go about doing this, often going through lots of processes. But the largest challenge uh, uh, when it comes up, is a lack of collaboration from uh, a, a piece of the production, which is always a result of not enough time, uh, or you know, just being really busy, or or actually just something's gone horribly wrong. Uh, and then you need that collaborative process to try and get everybody back on track and moving forwards. Um, and if that's not there, that makes it 10 times harder for visual effects to pick up pieces. Creative nerds are, um, you know, have lots of foibles, uh, and being a creative nerd is really useful in being able to get the best out of the, out of everybody. But also, visual effects encompasses so many different disciplines, from you know really heavy duty programming and coding to incredibly conceptual uh, out there artists to storytellers who are brilliant writers uh, and, and, and bringing all those people together and understanding um, where those strengths and weaknesses are across such a wide gamut of characters is really, uh, is really challenging. But I think when you get a handle on it, it can be incredibly rewarding. The biggest way to do it from, uh, from my perspective and as a production supervisor is creating relationships with all the people that are involved in the creative decision making and the putting together the nuts and bolts. So building that relationship and also what really helps is understanding how other departments work 
how camera department works and what's important to them and what isn't. Uh, and the same goes across the art department, and the production designer, and the makeup department, and the costume department, and the AD department. Uh, and having a good understanding of how everything fits together allows uh, somebody like myself to build a relationship up in a way that isn't obtrusive um, and is collaborative and allows everybody to actually, a visual effects is not a pain in the ass. Uh, it's uh, they do amazing things if if we all help each other out. Um, sometimes it's just not possible. Sometimes something is uh, is such left so left field that uh, it's only savable afterwards rather than at the time. So you know, those occasions come around. But as long as everybody's on board and go right, okay, well we're just going to have to deal with that later, then that's fine. You know, that's part of the process. Yeah, the visual effects companies are absolutely crucial to the process and my relationship is equally crucial uh, it, it's you know the, these uh, companies do their best work when they're involved and they're proud of what they're doing um, and I, I'm a huge fan of positive reinforcement uh, but also uh, just information and sort of giving them as much information that may not actually be strictly pertinent to a particular sequence that they're doing at the time gives them a level of involvement, which then allows them to come back with ideas that, again, might not be relative to their sequence, but it, it allows that process just to expand a bit more. Um, and then when you have that process, uh, and I'm still acting as that mediator between production and companies, then it, it, it elevates me in a really great way, because I got all these great ideas, half of them are from these companies, because they, they're involved and they're interested and they want to make a better job. Um, and that reflects across everybody. So. But, you know, directors really appreciate uh, that response and it's really helpful. So it, it is crucial. You can't uh, get an amazing result if you don't get on with your company. First of all, splitting up the work uh, from me is nearly always a straightforward proposition. How it works out in the detail is a complicated. But ultimately, spreading the work between companies allows you to spread the schedule and the timing of certain work, so you can take a particular sequence and give that to um, one company and then another sequence to another company. And then when it comes to crunch time, which is on every show, then you've got uh, two horses in the race rather than one pulling the same cart, which makes a huge difference. And we do get there uh, a bit smoother than if we had to rely on one company with one set of resources, uh, however large they are. That's a personal preference. There are, there are um, productions that do just use one company and rely very heavily on them. Um, but that just makes me slightly nervous. But also from a creative perspective, is that if you have sequences with very different challenges in them or very different ideas, concepts, or even just the way they look, it's really helpful to split that work across two interesting creative uh, supervisors or creative teams and then they can not be thinking about what the other one's thinking about. And it all comes down to time. You know, the more, the more they can focus their time on the thing that's really going to be really work for them, and that's the same for the other team, then when we all meet at the end, we've all put so much more work into a very specific sequence and a creative process. So splitting, um, splitting the work, for me, always, is always a benefit. I'd like to say that artistic is uh, is dominant in the process, but I am an artistic nerd, so uh, I get quite geeky and technical as well. But um, I think it's a sliding scale, and it's a sliding scale depending on where you are often in the process and what you're focusing on at a particular time. So, for example, um, you know, in the prep and script stages, it's very, very creative. Uh, that you're, you've got a little bit of technical knowledge knowing how you might put those things together at the end. Um, during the shoot, it can be quite technical because you're essentially just gathering data and picture and information and sort of understanding how all those things are gathered together in, in terms of technology, you know, the HDRI capture, motion capture, preview, virtual production. All those things have a very technical, uh, a technical foundation um, but we use it in an artistic way. So you, you need to have both, I think, to be able to get the best out of both the teams that are technical and the teams that are creative. Yeah, spatial acuity is really crucial, I think, in, in making those spaces feel real. It, again, it's dependent on 
those spaces. I mean, my experience, uh, it goes all the way back to my education as architecture is that, you know, spaces rely on space as much as the barriers, but also on light and texture and movement of how things move through those spaces. That that's become an incredibly useful uh, part of my experience to draw upon to design these spaces in the visual effects world at a later stage. And there is math involved when you're doing it in a very literal sense. Um, certainly when you're doing effects work, as well as some of the big builds, uh, the big sort of environment builds, there's a lot of maths. But ultimately we're trying to fool the eye at, at every stage, but we may be doing it in the most realistic way possible. But the other way might be not realistic at all, but it still just looks as good because we've cheated. Um, and then that requires a very different uh, tool set, which may not be mathematically based at all. And it, it is just making it up because it looks good. And you know, that can actually be really uh, successful. Ultimately, uh, in most cases, we are dealing with a final product that's two dimensional. Uh, and that's, that's the end user experience in most cases. Uh, so that's where we want to go to. We can start with three dimensions. We can start with all kinds of different ways of doing things, but ultimately, Everything ends up on a piece of film, old fashioned, not really, but a digital version of that. Um, and it is a frame and that's ultimately where you're heading. It's all about immersion for me is uh, you, you don't get it straight away. There's quite often directors and showrunners will have already been on the show for two years or a year or three years before uh, I even get involved. So it's, it's trying to get as much information out of them as possible with often small spaces of time. But it's also about um, references uh, and common ground in terms of how we think about uh, certain visuals and certain story points and references from other media, which may not even be film or television, but it could be theatrical. Uh, it could be just sort of photography, it could be documentary. It could be all kinds of different mediums that just allows us to work within a creative palette both story-wise and aesthetically. And then the more that is absorbed, then the more you start to think that way, you start to think like the director, you start to think like the DP, you start to think like the production designer uh, in those ways. So after a certain period of time, uh, as with all these things, you become a solid team who are all pulling in the same direction in, in creativity and in storytelling and in filmmaking. You know, the thing that I'm always nervous of is coming up with ideas that nobody else has thought of because they might just be completely mad and well and truly out at left field. But the more you get to know that process, the more that the ideas start to coalesce around the way that everybody else is thinking. So it's, it's essentially sort of gaining uh, creative confidence within the process. Uh, and that just takes a bit of time and it, it takes involvement with the other creatives. Um, but you know, beyond, there is, there's certainly a sort of tipping point where, uh, and it happens at different points within the production, sometimes it happens in post, sometimes in the middle of the shoot, where you start to come up with ideas and put those ideas forward to the DP, uh, you know, the director, the showrunner, and then they go, actually, that's a really good idea, let's do that. Um, it rarely happens at the very, very beginning, because it's you're still guessing where things are lying, what the level is, what the aesthetic is, uh, and how the characters might all react to that. So the, the picture editor has some great relationships with picture editors. Um, and it's, again, it's often to do with the amount of work that's involved and the complexity of the work that's involved. So, uh, you know, a, an editor may well not need to talk to the visual effects because nearly everything is in camera and we're just sort of filling holes or, or sort of filling gaps or enhancing what's already there. Um, so the collaboration is, is less. But when you've got heavy CG sequences where there isn't much to cut with except the previs, or there are significant gaps that need to be designed and then handed over to the picture editor, and there's a really heavy level of collaboration because they, uh, you know, their experience is cutting the story and, and making it flow and work. And that process is uh, something that cannot be mimicked by a visual effects supervisor. But we can help and supply them with all the bits that they might think works from one shot to another often sort of bridging shots. Other times it's entire sequences that you design from scratch, but you collaborate with the editor in terms of pace and shot design uh, and how it might fit within other parts of the edit. There are some uh, tremendously talented people in the industry 
I mean, one of my peers, I suppose, would be um, Angus Pickerton, who I worked with a uh, long time ago, nearly 20 years ago, um, and I learned a great deal from him, not only in terms of how visual effects works in the process, but just the, the sort of creative approach, the, you know, the passion for uh, every show and the way that you sort of interact with productions and with artists and with uh, and with production teams. Uh, it was, uh, I've worked with Angus a few times, um, but because we're now both production supervisors, that ha hasn't happened for a long time, but we still talk. So, you know, it's, it's probably a good sign. Um, and then there's, you know, directors. There's been some brilliant collaborative process with the directors. I've really enjoyed working with a, a director called Baba Najafi. Uh, who I did London Has Fallen with, um, and I did some development work with him on another show. Uh, and this, the, the the process is really uh, comfortable because you get to a point after you've done an entire show from beginning to end, you end up learning each other's shortcuts uh, and processes. And then you know that you gel as a creative team. So you then you get more out of it, not just in terms of the results, but also in terms of sort of personal um you know, reinforcement of how well you're doing and how you can collaborate and what ideas you can move around. With those people, um, you end up being able to do the opposite of what I was saying about the ideas and just putting all kinds of left field stuff out there because you know how everybody works. I mean, visual effects as a, uh, is a filmmaking uh, tool, much like um, every department is heading towards uh, a single vision, usually, or a single goal, uh, which is based around the director, showrunner, script, uh, and writers. Uh, and I think the, the, sometimes you can have a feeling that visual effects takes over the process, um, but that's uh, that's not something that I enjoy. I'd much rather we had uh, the DP, the production designer, and all the other creatives all have uh, you know, a significant contribution to what the visual effects is going to process. Um, and it's well understood, and you know, a lot of people uh, feel very much the same. It's not a sort of weird thing to suggest, um, but it can also work the other way. But I think with visual effects in the driving seat, it becomes about the visual effects very quickly um, because of the nature of the people that are involved in the whole process. Um, but it still needs to land with the story and with the characters uh, and, and with the, you know, the finished product. And visual effects should be part of that process rather than uh, at the front of it. Visual effects is a, a, a significant community. We all talk to each other. Uh, we all sort of show off about stuff that we've done and how we're doing and what we're doing next and what boundaries we're currently breaking. And this is the geek and the nerd and the artist in every visual effects person is that they love to explore and to solve problems. Even if we've just made those problems up ourselves, now let's solve it. Uh, which is really fascinating. Um, and with the surge of, um, you know, the power of the internet and the way that these creative ideas are all over the internet now, not just from high-end uh, visual effects companies doing really big work, but also from, you know, YouTube and LinkedIn and uh, all these sort of influencer outfits where people are just doing uh, visual effects at home and, and sort of crazy stuff, which looks really cool. And there's some brilliant ideas in there. and. Actually, there's a couple of productions I've been on where we sort of see those ideas. Oh, that's a really cool idea. That's how can we develop that for something that we want to be able to do? Can we use that? Um, so it's uh, it's tricky to keep abreast of the detail, um, but it is a, it's a big part of the job to keep abreast of the sort of big movers, the big changes, and the big innovations that are going on in visual effects, which happen every other year. And it's important because. Uh, most of the filmmakers, other than visual effects people, are not aware of the speed at which these things change. So you often approach some sequences that may not have had a visual effects person involved and it's designed in a certain way to accommodate a restriction uh, that visual effects might not, may end up being really complicated and expensive. And then you have a visual effects person who's up to date. They come along and go, actually, no, that's not a problem anymore because the software has changed and the hardware has changed. Uh, and this particular company over here is developed a pipeline, which means it can be done really, really quickly, and therefore we can do something better for the story because that's what we—that's what you originally wanted to do. Um, so it's yeah, it's important to be abreast of it, but it's challenging because there's a lot going on a lot of the time. 
So visual effects has been working remotely for a long time. Um, it isn't a wholly new experience from a visual effects point of view. I've supervised shows remotely um, from you know, from offices in different countries. And often visual effects shows are around the world anyway. You might have a company in Canada or Australia and Prague and London. So you have to worry more. You can't be in all those places and, and do your job. Um, and that's been the case for a long time for visual effects. The, obviously, the sea change is the is the the amount of remote working we do compared to not remote. Yeah, and that I think has made a significant difference. Even though uh, visual effects companies and some very talented people have done amazing work uh, and, and kept the sort of the boat afloat through COVID, which is an extraordinary job because if you lose all your um, you know, all your neighbours that sort of overnight, it's really hard to find the creative juices that often rely on casual interactions with an office or, you know, just walking past the water cooler and going, I've had this idea, what about if we turn it all upside down? Ooh, that's really cool. Having those ideas are, are the sparks, are the little bits and pieces that happen during a day rather than specifically in a Zoom meeting. So that's that's been a real challenge is sort of finding um, ways to shore up what we've lost in that sort of uh, uh, intuitive process. I think the biggest thing is uh, be more open, transparent and honest than you would be normally um, about what you're doing and how you're going about it and what you're doing uh, for the work. Because uh, I think the it's, it's easy to forget how much information we absorb when we're in the same room or we're in the, in the same office. Uh, and, you know, just seeing how somebody sits, for example, in an office, you can tell that that person might be tired or might be really struggling with a particular problem. And you can go over to that person and go, right, this is the problem, isn't it? How can we solve that? You can't do that on these meetings in the sort of remote. So then the people who are struggling or, or don't feel right about saying it need to fess up and go, yeah, this is a bit tricky. I don't quite know how to deal with it. So, it, and that is sort of, across lots of different sort of mini disciplines and lots of little areas that we're used to just absorbing because we're in the same space. And it's just about being more transparent than we're used to being, um, possibly slightly uncomfortably, uh, because you're, you know, you're, you're giving signals unconsciously a lot of the time and identifying those kind of things.